Uh, what kind of church is it? Uh, that's a question that you might well ask a friend or acquaintance who's moved to a new town and has started attending a new Anglican church. What kind of church is it? Well, the answer may be that it's Anglo-Catholic or Evangelical or Charismatic or Liberal, and sometimes there are combinations of these, such as Liberal Catholic or Mildly Charismatic. Yet even these labels do not do justice to the variety of churches that can be found today under the umbrella of Anglicanism. There are, at what we probably unfairly call the extremes, hardline evangelical and Anglo-Catholic churches united in opposition for different reasons to ordained women's ministry and so on. And in between these extremes there are many shades of churchmanship, over the years, I have met many of what I call faded evangelicals. These are churches that maintain the externals of evangelicalism, such as insistence on the need for individuals to make a personal commitment to Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, and patterns of worship and ministry directed to that end. However, if they are pressed to say whether they believe that anyone who does not make a personal commitment to Christ in this life will be punished eternally in hell, along with adherents of non-Christian religious faiths, they can become rather vague. Yet, if they do not believe in hell and punishment, from what does Jesus save those who make a personal commitment? I well remember from my national service days a Plymouth brother who constantly reminded the Christian fellowship to which we belonged that each minute thousands of souls were passing into eternal damnation and that this thought should galvanise us into evangelistic activity. I sometimes get the impression that faded evangelical churches, as I call them, lack urgency in what they do because they do not have any clear rationale for their evangelicalism. Just as I have met faded evangelicals, I have met woolly sacramentalists. These are people often who have moved from evangelicalism towards Anglo-Catholicism and have embraced something like the theology of the liturgical movement of the 1950s and 1960s. The Eucharist is central to what they do, the bread and wine represents the common things of life which they believe God blesses and returns to the communicants. The mission of these churches seems to be to maintain a Eucharistic ministry and to encourage parishioners to enjoy its benefits. Now, these sketches are no doubt caricatures and are almost certainly grossly unfair to the dedicated prayerful work done in these churches and I apologise to anyone who thinks that I'm criticising them personally. I'm not. I'm merely giving my impressions, which may of course be mistaken, of encounters with many types of churches over many years. Whether or not my sketches are fair or accurate, I'm convinced of one thing. I have never experienced in Britain anything like a German Lutheran church. Now there is of course the risk that I've become starry-eyed about a church of which I have little experience, but I can claim this much experience. I have on three occasions taken charge of a Lutheran congregation in Germany for a few weeks in the summer and have taken baptisms, weddings and funerals in addition to Sunday services and other pastoral work. Perhaps more importantly, I have twice led intensive courses for German theological students at residential summer academies, both lasting a fortnight. My impression from these experiences, as well as attendance at many German Lutheran services, are as follows. The most profound sermons that I've ever heard have been preached 
in German Lutheran services. Of course, I've heard a lot of indifferent ones as well. But I cannot think that such sermons would or could have been preached in an Anglican church. Secondly, the quality of students training for ordination in Germany is much, much higher than in England. I base this judgment on having taught many ordinands during 15 years in Durham, as well as acting as an external examiner in a number of Anglican theological colleges for many years. The students I taught at the German summer academies were of much higher quality. Now, it can be objected, of course, that I'm concentrating on intellectual ability and that because a person is clever, he or she will not necessarily be a good minister or priest, and of course that's true. But what impressed me about the German theological students was their profound understanding of what Christianity was about, compared with the frequent wooliness of their English counterparts. My third impression is that the church is taken far more seriously in Germany than in England in the public sphere. In England, it is now generally held that religion is a private, individual matter, and that the church is merely one of a number of faith groups that operate for the benefit of their members. The churches in Germany, without being established in the English sense, are taken much more seriously in the public sphere. Now, you may well ask, where, all this, where is all this leading to? I've often asked myself why we cannot have in England something that resembles the German Lutheran churches, churches that are liberal and at the same time positive, churches that know what they do believe rather than knowing what they do not believe, churches that are able to attract into their ministry young people from the top 5% of academic ability, churches that are taken seriously in civic and national life. The answer to this question is that there is a tradition within Anglicanism that would fit this bill. The broad church tradition of the 19th century and the purpose of the 2013 Beachy Fabby Lent lectures is to consider this tradition anew and to see what it might look like in the 21st century. Now, before going into details, it's worth comparing the situation facing the Church of England in the middle of the 19th century with the situation facing it today. In the mid-19th century, the Church of England was deeply divided, not as today over gender and ministry matters, but over baptism, an issue that affected how one understood the nature of the church and its task. The mid-19th century was a time of change and upheaval. The Industrial Revolution was transforming the country. People moved from the countryside to the towns to find employment that made them live in appalling slums and which required their children to work for 12 hours a day, six days a week in mills and factories. Parliamentary reform was attacking the privileged position enjoyed by the Church of England. While the Church census of March 1851 revealed that in some parts of the country only a third of the population attended Sunday services and that more worshippers went to Methodist services than to Anglican services. In Sheffield, for example, out of a population of a little over 135,000, 43,000, so that's less than a third, had attended Sunday worship, and this figure included those who had attended twice, as well as Sunday school children, so the figure was well under a third. Anglican attendances, and this is people going twice, had totaled 14,881, while the figures for Wesleyan, Primitive and New Connection Methodists was 15,271. 
and you could add to that, of course, um, Baptists, Independents, um, Roman Catholics, Salvation Army. Just as today, the presence of non-Christian religious communities in Britain has led to pressure for the Christian churches to be sidelined as merely one instance of many faith communities. So it was argued in the mid-19th century that the Church of England no longer represented the majority of Christians in the land. Now, I shall focus in this lecture today on the response of four Anglicans to this situation. Uh, Julius Hare, who became Archdeacon um, in, um, in the Diocese of Chichester, Archdeacon of Lewis. Um, Frederick Denison Morris, uh, for many years chaplain of Lincoln's Inn and um, uh, also professor at London and Cambridge. Charles Kingsley, I mean, well known for his books, The, the Water Babies, Westwood Ho, um, for many years vicar of Eversley in Hampshire. And Frederick William Robertson, who is known usually as Robertson of Brighton, a, a remarkable preacher, as you will hear. Hare, Morris and Kingsley were very close to each other. Hare had been Morris's tutor at university, and Kingsley regarded Morris as his great mentor. And all three had connections to Germany, either directly or indirectly, and a common friend was a man called Baron Bunsen. Um, I think one of his ancestors had invented the Bunsen bur burner, of which you may have been uh, familiar at uh, chemistry lessons at school. But Bunsen was a Prussian diplomat in Britain and himself a distinguished Old Testament scholar. But they were also deeply influenced by the poet and philosopher Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who had studied in Germany, had absorbed German idealist philosophy and had written theological works of great profundity. Robertson did not strictly belong to this group, but in his short life, his sermons preached in Brighton made a deep impression on anyone who was looking for a fresh understanding of the Christian gospel in the mid-19th century. His views were close to those of the others. And the issue of baptism shows how the broad church group made a distinctive contribution to the theology and practice of the day. The issue of baptism, which divided the Church of England so sharply and which was so important in the mid-19th century, was brought to a head by the so-called Gorham Controversy. Now, the 39 Articles of Religion of the Church of England are the classic statement of Anglican belief and doctrine. Uh, when I was ordained, uh, which is what, 48 years ago, um, I had to subscribe to them. I'm not sure what clergy have to do today, um, but I certainly had to subscribe to them. And Article 27 states, and I quote, baptism is a sign of regeneration or new birth. The question was, what did this mean? High churchmen took regeneration to mean that the original sin of a baptized infant was washed away and that the infant was given a new nature. Regeneration was equivalent to conversion. This view has been summed up as follows, quote, through baptism, man receives a new nature and thus a moral change takes place. Now, such a view was understandably quite unacceptable to the evangelicals, for whom conversion, that is, conscious decision to accept Jesus Christ as Saviour, was the only method of entry into the church. Baptism gave a claim on the part of the baptised infant to be a recipient of the forgiveness and salvation offered in Jesus Christ, but it did not alter the nature of the baptised child. It altered the child's status as a potential recipient of a new nature. Now, these two views of baptism radically affected how the high church 
and evangelical parties understood the task of the church. For high churchmen, the task was to build upon what infants had received in baptism. For evangelicals, the task was to bring the unconverted baptized infant to a personal decision for Christ. Now, I shall not say much about the Gorham controversy, which arose when Bishop Philpotts of Exeter, a high churchman, refused to institute the Reverend G.C. Gorham, an evangelical, to a living in his diocese on the ground that Gorham held a view of regeneration contrary to the teaching of the Church of England. For Gorham, baptism conferred a new nature only if it was worthily received, but not otherwise. Gorham appealed, it was eventually decided by the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, that his views were not contrary to the declared doctrine of the Church of England. However, there was a third way of approaching the matter, and this was strongly expressed by F.W. Robertson in two sermons preached in March 1850 at the time of the Gorham Judgment. His objection to the Roman Catholic view, a view that he said was embraced in various ways by the Anglican High Churchman, was that if a rite or ceremony, i.e. baptism, was duly and properly performed, original sin was removed, there was a change of nature, and a new character was imparted, whether or not the recipient was aware of this or responded to it. The Calvinist view, which is how he described the evangelical, the Calvinist view made being a child of God dependent upon having particular religious experiences. According to Robertson, Rome and Calvinism were both wrong because they tried to create a fact. Rome by baptizing and Calvinism by insisting on certain religious experiences. However, the fact was that all children, when they are born, are children of God. Baptism cannot create this fact. It can only affirm it. Conversion cannot create this fact. It can only acknowledge it. As Robertson said, baptism does not create a child of God. It authoritatively declares him to be so. It does not make the fact. It only reveals it. Robertson went on to criticize the view that a person is not a child of God until baptism has been administered or until a person has been converted. And similar views were held by Morris and Kingsley, and Kingsley drew profound implications from this for the social problems of his day. I quote from Kingsley, How dare you, in the face of the baptismal sign, keep God's children exposed to filth, brutality and temptation, which fester in your courts and alleys, making cleanliness impossible, drunkenness all but excusable, prostitution all but natural, self-respect and decency unknown. Theologically, the view of Robertson, Morris and Kingsley was a claim that the Christian church had a universal function. It was there not simply to look after its own interests and members, but to carry out the implications of Genesis chapter 1, that the universe was created by God and that humankind was created in God's image. Baptism was a public declaration of this fact. Baptism, declared Robertson, quote, is a visible witness to the world of that which the world is forever forgetting, a common humanity united in God. It is instructive to pause for a moment to compare this vision with baptismal practice in the Church of England today. Baptism seems to have been reduced to a rite of entry into the church, with not a few parishes refusing it to families 
that do not regularly attend worship and offering instead a service of thanksgiving for the birth of the child. Here in the Abbey, it is certainly my view that we are acting in the spirit of Robertson and the others and are declaring publicly that the children brought for baptism are the children of God with all that that implies for the nature of society and the church's task to declare and express the lordship of God over every area of human life. At the beginning of Robertson's second sermon on baptism, there is an important observation that leads to the next part of the lecture. Robertson wrote that the truth for him did not lie, I quote, in a middle course between the two extremes of what he called Romish and modern Calvinistic views, but in a truth deeper than either of them. The truth not in a middle course between the two extremes, but in a truth deeper than either of them. This could be taken as a definition of what has come to be called the broad church, a label, incidentally, which Morris and Kingsley thoroughly disliked. They were not trying to find a middle way. They were trying to find a deeper way. Now, I shall be saying a lot about this deeper way in the course of the lectures, but I shall try to give a hint about the origin and nature now of this deeper way. In an essay written by F.D. Morris about his former mentor and tutor, Julius Hare, Morris mentioned that Hare's aunt had once wished that he would burn all his German books. She was expressing the view common in England around 1820 that the critical thought that was being applied in Germany to the Bible, Christian tradition and theology was destroying Christianity and ruining the church. And Hare wrote to his aunt in January 1820 as follows. As for my German books, I hope from my heart that the day will never arrive when I shall be induced to burn them. I shall never be able to repay an hundredth part of the obligation I am under to them. For to them I owe the best of all my knowledge, and if they have not purified my heart, the fault is my own. Above all, to them I owe my ability to believe in Christianity with a much more implicit and intelligent faith than I otherwise should have been able to have done." End of quote. Hare was expressing what others were feeling then and have found since, that the German Lutheran tradition offered such a profound understanding of the nature of Christianity that it could welcome critical academic thought and enable people to be both critical and believing. A hint of the part played by Coleridge in making this possible for English churchmen came in the following passage in Morris's essay. He spoke of those who had come to believe that, quote, man is not an animal carrying about a soul, but a spiritual being with an animal nature who, when he has sunk lowest into that nature, has still thoughts and recollections of a home to which he belongs and from which he has wandered. Such people asked, where is that home? How can we ever come to it? Coleridge had taught that even if science had become omniscience, it could not interpret that cry for a living God. Coleridge had taught that people should not give up their search, but should follow it tirelessly until it brought them to their father's house. Now, for me, this is a profound description of what is often called disparagingly folk religion. And it explains why this abbey is filled to overflowing on Christmas Eve. 
and why people who do not normally come to church want to bring their babies to be baptised. The challenge, especially to a broad church, is to help people find an answer to the question, where is that home from which we seem to have wandered? How can we ever come to it? F. D. Morris's contribution to the deep thinking that characterised his circle was based on his understanding of Genesis chapter 1. God had created the universe and humankind in his own image. It followed that all human life was hallowed and that God intended that there should be a spiritual society or kingdom that enabled God's children to live together in love and harmony under his lordship. The Bible bore witness to this spiritual kingdom in the story of the Israelite people in the Old Testament and in the teaching of Jesus about the kingdom of God in the New Testament. This spiritual kingdom was not identical with the church or the nation state, though both embodied aspects of it. It was the task of the church to bear witness to the existence of this spiritual kingdom and to endeavour to see that it was made visible in the daily lives of ordinary people. In a sermon preached in May 1851, Morris criticised clergy who thought of themselves as belonging to a class that was jealous of its own privileges, power and prestige. No, he insisted. We clergy, and I quote, are sent into the world to bear witness for the consecration and the holiness of God's entire family. We become guilty when by our words or acts we lead you to think that you have not received this consecration, that you are not set apart to God, that you and your children and your occupations are not holy in his sight." End of quote. However, this task of proclaiming that all human enterprise was sacred to God also entailed judgment. It was the duty of the priest to proclaim that all disorders and anomalies in society were contrary to God's will and that, quote, statesmen as well as churchmen instead of tolerating and excusing them, ought to be labouring day and night for the removal of them. Now, given these views, it is no surprise that Morris had wide-ranging social concerns. Together with Kingsley and J.M. Ludlow, he met on the evening of the 10th of April, 1848, following the great Chartist demonstration on Kennington Common to discuss action. And two days later, joined by J.C. Hare and Alexander J. Scott, decided to launch a newspaper entitled Politics for the People. This was the beginning of the Christian Socialist Movement of 1848, not, of course, to be confused with the, the political um, socialism of Marx and Engels and others. And in a tract on Christian Socialism, Morris declared that it was necessary to get rid of the idea that, quote, Christ is the head of a set of religious men, the head of a sect of Christians. It was necessary to believe, quote, that he is actually the Son of God and the Son of Man. Morris and his circle helped to organise, among other things, higher education for women. Uh, Kingsley was tireless in his parish in organising um, education literacy for men and women to improve the, the lot and everything of, of his parishioners. I mean, when he went to Eversley about 1838, I mean, communion was celebrated three times a year and so an astonishing transformation that he brought about. Um, and, of course, they became involved in trades associations and industrial disputes. Kingsley's novels, Alton Locke and the Water Babies, of course, sought to bring a Christian perspective to the social problems of his day. But no account 
of the theology of the broad church circle can be complete unless we deal with the most important theological question of all, how did the ministry and death of Jesus bridge the gulf between God and humanity, a gulf created by the evil and wickedness of the human race? Robertson addressed this in a sermon preached in June 1850 and entitled The Sacrifice of Christ, and he took as his text 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 15, a, a passage that some of us have been wrestling with uh, here in the Abbey in our study group. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and arose again. Robertson spoke as follows, and I must quote him because I can't begin to match his language. This is Robertson. There was scarcely a form of evil with which Christ did not come into contact and by which he did not suffer. He was the victim of false friendship and ingratitude the victim of bad government and injustice. He fell a sacrifice to the vices of all classes, to the selfishness of the rich and the fickleness of the poor. Intolerance, formalism, suspicion, hatred of goodness were the foes which crushed him. But he did this on behalf of all. I quote again, if you have been a false friend, a skeptic, cowardly disciple, a formalist, selfish, an opposer of goodness, an oppressor, whatever evil you have done, you are one of that mighty rabble which cry, crucify him. Yet Christ is also the example of perfect humanity. He is God's idea of man completed. He offers to God the sacrifice that only he can offer, that of perfect suffering love on behalf of others. And God, in accepting that sacrifice, accepts sinful humanity for Christ's sake. We cannot approach God on our own behalf. We can only do so by recognizing that Christ has done for us what we could not do for ourselves and that this is all the Father's work. Having read that noble statement from Robertson, the following verse of a well-known hymn comes to mind. Look, Father, look on his anointed face, and only look on us as found in him. Look not on our misusings of thy grace, our prayer so languid and our faith so dim, for lo, between our sins and their reward, we set the passion of thy Son, our Lord. Well, this then is just some tiny glimpse into the attempt of the broad church theologians to articulate this deeper way. And in the remaining lectures, I shall try to ask how we can have a broad church theology for ourselves today, not one that tries to find a middle way, but one that tries to find a deeper way.